Hi, welcome to the latest episode of NAMI New York Skate Perspectives, your show to keep you connected, supported, and inspired as we navigate our current uncertain times. And normally, um, as the show started, we were talking specifically about COVID and, and how we're navigating this and maintaining our mental wellness and overcoming challenges. But as our journey has moved forward, we're looking at bigger issues now, and we're really excited today uh, July 1st will be at, is actually the first day of Black and Indigenous People of Color uh, Mental Health Awareness Month. It used to be called Minority Mental Health Month, but we don't like the term minority. It's, it makes people sound, uh, you know, less than what they are. So we're very excited to celebrate diversity, and we have an incredible guest here with us today. We have Dr. Will Farkason, who is uh, the director of the Child and Adolescent uh, psychiatry outpatient clinic at Stony Brook Medicine. He is also the co-chair of the New York State Office of Mental Health uh, Multicultural Action Committee. So Dr. Farkinson, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your perspectives with us. Yes, thank you, Matthew, for having me. Oh, of course. So, um, you know, before we get into the meat of the potatoes of our conversation, and um, I just want to check in with you, see how you and your family are doing during these difficult times um, and how you're navigating both the COVID situation, social isolation, and of course, all the, the civil unrest and the feelings uh, generated by the very difficult images, very painful images of watching multiple murders, George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey. I mean, I would go down the list, but so can you kind of just check in and let us know uh, how you're navigating everything? Yeah, so um, I can I can start with the the COVID nineteen um, global pandemic and how that's you know impacted me first, and then um, I can speak sure. about the racial trauma that I've experienced lately as well. Um, so yeah, obviously along with everybody else, COVID nineteen was a very challenging time. Um, the abrupt stopping of, of daily life and routine as we've known it. Um, I have young children, um, one of which was involved in in school and daycare, so for her to um, to stop abruptly um, and not seeing her friends as much. Uh, we're fortunate enough in my family that we have family nearby that was able to come in and, and support us. So that was helpful um, as my wife and I are both essential healthcare workers. And so I had to continue to care for people, um, which you know brings on a lot of anxiety and, and worry. Um, so when they speak about people that were on the front lines, my wife was definitely one of the people on the front lines um, caring for others. And so, you know, it really disrupts the entire flow of the family, um, the way that we have, we're doing things. Um, but I am happy to say, you know, our family's been been through worse, <laughs> and we've managed. And so we really pulled together and supported one another. And I think that was a key ingredient to our success. And so as things in New York have lightened up a little bit, um, you know, we're still pretty careful. Um, we're not really going out as much. Um, but it is nice to be able to have family come over and celebrate birthdays even remotely but with some social distancing for most um, but it is nice to see um, that as a whole everybody in my family for the most part was safe um, and those that you know needed care got it and so that's that's fortunate we're fortunate for that um, so thank you for asking yeah and thank you for the work that you and your wife do and, and providing care every day not just to your family but to all New Yorkers or New Yorkers in Long Island thank you so much for what you do yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, in regards to, to the racial trauma piece, um, there was definitely a time, you know, in, in the first couple of weeks after the George Floyd incident, or the video of the George Floyd incident surfaced, um, followed closely by the video that surfaced of Ahmaud Arbery, and then hearing the stories of what happened to Breonna Taylor. Um, these, these stories have become to be all too familiar, um, and I think this was the time, it always hurt and it always impacted me, but I think this time, this, this series of incidents really drew, drove me to, into action and into taking people to task um, on racial bias and, and, finding, and making sure that institutions are aware of the impact of the racial trauma on people of color, right? So as healthcare workers in particular, we're expected to continue to care for people regardless of their political views, religious views, their um, backgrounds. And so knowing that you could be caring for someone that um, would justify the murder of George Floyd um, and would 
criminalize the behavior of Rashard Brooks and over um, the loss of life. Um, some of those things are more troubling. And, and so, and those that continue to proclaim that blue lives matter and all lives matter in a, in a, rebut, in a direct rebuttal to the right. Black Lives Matter movement, um, it really does, it, 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 it hits you different, right? So essentially what I, I've been trying to call on the institutions that I'm associated and affiliated with or employed by to make sure that they're taking care of healthcare workers um, that are impacted by racial trauma. You know, it, it's terribly unfair, you know, to be in that position and you're going to do your job because it's the job you signed up for. You're, same thing with COVID. You're going to run in, you know, while everybody's running away from the fire, you're running in. Um, and so you're going to do your job, but it also would be nice to know that you're supported by the institution that, you know, benefits from you doing a qual high quality care. And so that's professionally. I have to also say that personally, there was a point where I was not okay. I was, I was very frustrated, very sad, um, and frankly, raged, um, rageful about um, when I saw the videos uh, of the murder of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery, um, because the, you know, to know that essentially that could be me. You know, I'm a professional, my Monday through Friday, nine to five, but you know, without a shirt and tie, without you know the doctor symbol you know tattooed on my forehead um, I can be perceived as any one of those brothers or sisters that were murdered and so it's it's truly um, impacting and to know that you know we have children that are growing up in this world and I know that there was a time where my grandparents and my parents prayed that the world would be kinder to our generation um, as I now pray for my children that the world would be kinder a kinder place for them and to really start to wonder is that realistic um, to know that you know here we are in 2020 and, and making the same horrid mistakes over and over again with no reprieve and, and, and no justice and so that to me has been really impactful and it, it has impacted my friends and it has impacted my family and um, you know as a collective it's, it's time for change and it's really time for change for um, other people you know, it, it no longer needs to be the burden of black people to teach people about racism and to make racial justice change. It needs to be a collective effort. Um, and, and, you know, quite frankly, we're tired of saying the same things over and over again. Sure. I, there's so many points, so much to unpack there. I'm going to start with the last thing you said first, because I think that's so interesting that the burden of, of black people to have to teach white people what it means to be black or what your experiences are, you know, I saw a very interesting presentation the other day. Um, it was, there was three different presentations. It was, it was women. One was a woman who had lost her brother to a police, in a police incident. The other was talking about racism in the corporate culture. But the third was actually a white woman who's married to a black man and has, they live in a small town in Connecticut. They have three children and uh, their three children or three of the four black children in their schools. But what she really talked about is, is her learning process and that, you know, and, and the thing that really stuck on with me is that it wasn't up, you know, in the beginning, her husband taught her things because he had to, right? You know, when they were out together and there were like little things that she didn't even think twice about, but he was like, yo, you got to pump the brakes on that. You know, you're with me. We can both end up in a bad situation. But after that, how much she took it upon herself to learn about these things and, you know, for a white woman to have to tell her black children, this is how you act with police. This, you know, it, it was a very interesting thing. But, you know, for you, obviously, as you know, so, both a child a psychiatrist dealing with children and as a father of uh, young children, as you say, how, what do you, how do you talk to kids about this? I mean, you know, talk, educating white America is a whole nother thing, but for a kid to have to see any type of violence, you know, it's traumatic, obviously, but they, they see you know, violence against someone who looks like their father or their mother. And, and even in their young minds, I would have to imagine they make that connection that that could be my dad, that could be me. So, you know, how do you explain to your children or and, and uh, you know, children that you work with what's going on and dealing with the fears that they have? I mean, I can't imagine how hard it is for them to process all this. Yeah, so I think uh, the, obviously the key is to share what's developmentally appropriate, right? And so um, my daughter's three years old. And so we've 
started to have some conversations about her skin color and, and I want her to know, um, I want to be the one to tell her that her skin color is different from everybody's. Um, and I want her to hear that at home. And I also want her to hear that her skin color makes her beautiful. Um, and, or is one of the components of what makes her a more beautiful person. So uh, I'm not comfortable with someone else of her peers uh, based off of what their parents may or may not have shared with them, sharing that they're different. And, and so I want her to hear that at home. So I started to have those conversations and in particularly, I'll be honest, I've started to have those conversations this week and it's directly in response to what's happening in the world because as we know what happens in the world, teachers may be talking about it we know that other families have probably talking about it with their kids. And so it's important that our kids get what's developmentally appropriate. Now, when I talk to my adolescents, I obviously share a little bit more. You know, when I'm, I'm working with a, a young male of color, I'm asking them, how are you doing? You know, I know you're seeing what's on social media. I know you're seeing what's in the news. Um, how is it impacting you? You know, and, and not having just the conversation about, you know, what to do when you're stopped by the police, but more of, okay, but how does it impact you that you have to have that conversation, that that has to be something that's taught to you that you know is not gonna be taught to other people um, and the trauma that comes from that. Uh, so again, what's developmentally appropriate, I want people, you know, I want, I think it's important that parents share these things at home um, and, and get their kids ready to, to have the conversation and to understand um, and, and to be able to counter arguments of, oh, look, they're just stealing, you know, tennis shoes and jewelry. They don't really care about the death of George Floyd. Um, but to really arm some, of, especially some of our older adolescents to be able to say, hey, listen, you know, that's true that they shouldn't do that. But look what's happening as a result. Okay, you, you have to look at the rage that's come out sends a message for sure. But the, the results is now that people are waking up. And I think it was because of a fear of, of the possibility of a race war in America. So now the governor of New York State, although these issues have not happened in New York State, the governor is now taking action and, and removing things of like a chokehold, which is antiquated and, and, and resulted in death in the state of New York already. And so well, now we're removing it. happened in New York. I mean, we had Eric Garner and, and Staten Island. I mean, it's not exactly. like we're immune to this. Exactly. But, but my point is that it's now because of the most recent incidents, right? So that actually should have come right. immediately following the death of Eric Gardner. But now because of the way that people are responding and the rage that's coming out and, and, and all of the attention that this matter is getting, these actions are coming forth. And, I, and I'm not saying anything against the, the governor. I applaud his efforts. At the same time, because of the way that we've responded or the way that folks have responded, Juneteenth is now a holiday. Right, so we're now recognizing that the racial trauma that people are experiencing, they should have a holiday to sit back and reflect on their culture. That should be afforded to them because it's afforded that we have Columbus Day and you know, uh, Fourth of July and all these other holidays that you know, some of them, quite frankly, rooted in white supremacy in America. Right, so let's yeah. call it what it is. Yeah. And so now we're able to have a holiday for ourselves. And really, it's, it's a, I won't say too little too late, but it's quite late for yeah. sure. Um, and it's certainly not enough. Right. Um, but there's action happening. Corporations are taking action. Um, governors, policymakers are hearing as a result. Because if this would have gone on as it's gone before, where we're upset for a few days, and then maybe they press charges, and then maybe we wait and see if those charges end up going you know, past the grand jury, it's kind of like, oh, we'll just give a little bit, give a little bit, give a little bit and see, give a little bit and see. And now it's being, the message is, no, this is unacceptable. And then there's the response of George Floyd. Okay, well, we've pressed charges for the murder. Okay, now we want the rest. Okay, we pressed charges on all the officers. That's still not enough because we know what's happening, right? We're kicking the can down the street right. because we want to see action. We want to see justice and we're not going to stop until we see justice. Mm. That's woken up the eyes of a lot of people and made some positive change. Yeah. You know, it's interesting what you say. I, I would imagine we're about the same age. And, and so, like you said, we've seen this before. I mean, obviously, I remember going back to, to Rodney King and, 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 and watching what was going on in L.A. And, and, and so forth and so on. But 
Do you feel like this is different? I mean, as you say, before these things would happen, there would be a lot of outrage, and then they would fizzle out with nothing really positive taking place from it. To me, as an outside perspective, there are several reasons why I, I, I think this feels different. Obviously, seeing these things on video and, and seeing murder on, on TV and, and, you know, it's like, you know, the public lynchings that used to happen in the South, right in the, the center square of the town or whatever. And it's like, I think white America has woken up to this too. And, and you know, the fact that when you see these protests, it's not just black people, it's, it's white people, it's all people. And, and, you know, to come out in these very dangerous times, you know, where putting everyone who's out there is literally putting themselves at risk because of the disease and, you know, other things going on. But so do you think it's different? Do you think it's sustainable? And, and you know, I know we're seeing the, the statues come down, we're seeing corporations make changes, like you say, but, you know, how, and how, how do we keep it sustainable, I guess, in your opinion? So uh, do I think it is, does that potentially be sustainable? I would say yes. Um, how does that happen? Um, I think it's kind of what I alluded to before, you know, the work that needs to be done it's not like we can just now go to all the people of color in our institutions and say, okay, now teach us what to do. Mm -hmm. um, no, there's literature out there. There's been guidance given in the past. Now go dust those books off, dust those initiatives off that have been sent to you, read them and, and put policy into action. And then after you've started to do that and you want to evaluate what you've done, come and ask us, you know, come and ask us, is the work environment different? Come and ask us, do we feel safer when we're engaging with police? There's a, there's a, it's going to take a long time. Um, I still, you know, I have a son just turned one years old. I still intend to have a conversation with him about police uh, brutality and what it means and how to, to conduct himself because it's a life-saving conversation. He's going to have that conversation at 10, right? And so, which means nine years from now, no matter what's taking place today, I still will not have full faith in law enforcement agents in interacting with my son. And so when you come to evaluate, I'm still intending to have that conversation, no matter what's changed as of today. And so the burden now becomes on all people to make sustainable change and to be in it for the long haul. We don't want to hear, well, we did this in 2020, so you should be happy in 2030. Absolutely not. You know, this work continues. You know, this is, that's the other thing that's happened over time. Slavery was so long ago. Jim Crow was so long ago. Well, clearly not, mm. right? We're still having you know, the same it's interesting. issues. You know, so many people too thought, oh, we elected Barack Obama. Well, that was the finish line. That erases, you know, 400 years of, of everything that's gone on. But we know that's not true. There really is no finish line. I don't think it's anything that will ever be complete. We can always get better. We can always improve. Exactly. Oh, and, and for me, you know, Pivoting a little bit on something else that you said to me, which is, is very interesting, is that you can't look at the civil rights movement, our current civil rights movement, or I guess any civil rights movement, without separating the mental health impact of this community and the traumas that have impacted this community. You know, as a child psychiatrist, something that I talk about a lot is, um, you know, over-medicated children of color seem to be over-medicated a lot for like ADHD from what I've read, you know. A lot of times the child can't pay attention in school because they're really worried about, you know, are they going to encounter violence on the way home? Are they going to be able to eat when they get home? All serious, serious worries that no child should have to burden. And that's why they can't pay attention in school. But a teacher will see a child that can't pay attention in school and say, oh, they must have ADHD without ever really digging and asking what, what's wrong with the child. So, um, you know, as a child psychiatrist, number one, I mean, do you see that? I mean, the, the, what has this trauma impact children? And, and really, we, I mean, we know about ACEs and the impact of trauma uh, throughout life, but this is a very unique type of trauma. It's, you know, a lot of times someone ha might have a traumatic event. It's an acute event that has a long lasting impact on them, but it was a very, acute event. It happened and, and you moved on. This is a trauma that's not acute. I mean, it's, it's always there for a lot of kids. So can you talk about that a little bit and how that trauma from a very early age manifests itself, you know, throughout sort of someone's life? 
And so I think there's a, a couple of things. I mean, yes, some of the points that you brought up are valid where um, folks that have been traumatized or had an acute event or have experienced community violence um, or their families have experienced community violence, they tend to be more on edge. Um, other, I think there are other contributing factors too, though, um, when it comes to the education system that make it difficult for um, young, young people of color to be successful. I think that some of the things that we discussed about racism play out in the education system, right? So um, America is founded on principles of European principles of individualism and, and working for yourself and doing things for yourself and people of color. Uh, so folks in Latin countries, Asian countries, African countries, more collectivistic. So they work as, as a team and work in collectives. And so that alone, you know, that, that, that level of stimulation may be different. Um, so if you're saying, look, focus on your work, sit still, don't move, when the, to a person that's used to interacting with a larger group and stimulation comes from a larger group. So that act, acting out behavior could be them just trying to act out their norms of how they're predisposed to con conduct themselves and to succeed. So that's one part. Um, additionally, we know that, you know, in, there's a thing called intergenerational trauma. And, and really start folks starting to look at how the DNA gets reshaped uh, based off of traumatic experiences and how um, in particular men of color are passing on their DNA, the shape of their DNA and the trauma experiences to generation to generation to generation. Um, so that has a little bit to do with environment, but it also is there's a strong component about science and nature that's, that's playing out there. And so of course now, compound that with looking at images of yourself on TV, um, being criminalized and then later victimized because of the, skull, the color of your skin. There are a lot more things on the minds of, of, of black students in the classroom. Um, there, there are things that they've had to encounter on the way to school and, and not just community violence, um, how their teachers greeted them, you know, how the bus driver treats them, um, what, their peers say behind their backs as they go to the lunch line. You know, they get a little more sizable portion. It could be for a variety of reasons. Maybe they didn't eat at home, but maybe they did and they're just a hungry kid. You know, it doesn't need an over an analysis. And, and why would we attribute that analysis to that person because of the color of their skin, right? And so, um, and those things happen. Those are like some of those microaggressions, you know, even saying, oh, you know, here, take an extra apple. I know you're hungry. That's a, a racial microaggression to a kid of color. You know, and, and they may not fully understand that it is, and it won't be until years later when they look back. back. And so now you have a 12 year old that's realizing all this time that someone, you know, experienced white guilt when they were in elementary school and was trying to make up for lost time was really a way of disenfranchising them further and saying that we know that you're hungry people. You know, meanwhile, their, their plate is always full at home. So. That, that brings up these like levels of rage that can, can occur um, later in life. And then we also know, I mean, there's a, there's a fourth grade, um, fourth grade, wow, the name is escaping me. But essentially there's, there's literature that says that there's a fourth grade black boy syndrome. And then that in fourth grade is when boys of color, their behavior that was once cute and admirable in the classroom then becomes problematic and defiance. Um, and so, what, and it's, it's kind of, if you, if you ask most men of color if they've experienced it, they will, right? Because prior to third grade, they're cute, they're lovable, they're happy, they're stimulating, they're engaging, and then all of a sudden they're talking too much um, and they have to go to the principal's office. Um, all of a sudden they're disruptive. Um, when it used to be cool to have him make a joke in the classroom, it's now disruptive to the entire classroom environment. And so, and, and that starts the process of criminalization of behavior. That's fascinating. Wow. So interesting. So I want to touch on something that you said earlier and combine it with something that you just said. So you were talking about the you know, generational trauma, how that gets passed down. And, and when we kind of started this conversation and, and you were talking about the rage that you and your friends are experiencing and, and kind of talking about that. So Something that I'm really, really proud of that NAMI is, is working on is introducing our support and education programs into Queensbridge, which is, uh, you know, the country's le leading public housing facility. And we've got an amazing response from that community. But like, 
in talking to the viewer, we have a few a resident advisory that we've been working with, and they're saying, you know, one of the first things somebody said to me is, our community is so mentally ill, we don't even know it. Like, we are so traumatized, we have so many issues, and, and our biggest problem is we can't talk about it. Like, we're, we, we, we can't share what we're feeling, and, and you giving us that arena just to be say it's okay to talk about it is so important. So can you kind of talk, I know traditionally, I, I think, you know, um, the, the New York City First Lady, Shirley McRae, talks about her, in her family, how she saw depression in her parents and they just thought they could tough it out. And I think that's kind of a, a, a hallmark in a way of, of the black community. I, you could probably speak much better than I to that, but the importance of talking about it and admitting that you have the problem. Do you see that starting to change? Like, you know, I think as a society as a whole, we've been reluctant to talk about our mental health, but I think it's been even more stigmatized in different multicultural communities. I know, you know, the Latino community, island culture has their own thoughts about mental health and the black, but do you think that's changing? And how important is that changing to the overall sustainability that we were talking about earlier of this movement? So I think um, I would agree that it is changing. I mean, my, my clinical experience is, is, is that people of color have been seeking out um, therapy, uh, but I also will be clear that I think they, they want to, a lot of them overwhelmingly are seeking out people of color to provide therapy, right? So that's sure. another um, contributing factor to healthcare disparities. Folks want people that they at least perceive them to understand them and understand at least a little bit about some of the systemic things that they're up against. Um, and so, and then I do believe that quality care can be delivered by people of all races. I won't, don't get me wrong. No. But I think that sometimes it, there's a comfort when you can walk in to an office, you know, the week of a George Floyd murder being viewed and just exhale differently. Um, to your point, one of the, the piece of language that I've been using more recently um, is really pushing for herd immunity for mental health in, in people of color communities. Um, and, and the reason being is that th there has been a stigma about it, um, but I think we have to be clear, right, that that stigma comes from white people and, and, and healthcare workers won't care about your problems. So we'll deal with them in-house. Um, and if we have a hard time going, dealing in-house, then we'll go to the church, because um, that's where we're accepted. Um, we don't, you know, we don't want to, and then the other part is the systems at play, right? So healthcare workers, psychologists, therapists, social workers, all kind of go into the same umbrella of CPS and, and people that remove people from their homes. And so and those systems have not always been kind and fair to people of color. And so the cultural mistrust, which is a known phenomenon, it used to be called cultural paranoia, but folks used to really think that Black people were paranoid when they wouldn't open up to white therapists and, mm -hmm. and psychiatrists. But the reality is, is there was cultural mistrust and there's good reason for it. You know, going to a healthcare worker, you know, our history where we've been studied, you know, you're talking about like the syphilis experiments and things like that, where we've been researched unfairly. Um, it has, a, it, sometimes it's a healthy paranoia. It's a healthy mistrust to be cautious of people. And then, then again, this goes back to why the burden needs to be on all folks. You know, um, people that are privileged really need to make sure that they are doing everything in their care and they, in their ability to provide equitable care and, and to be understanding why folks don't open up right away and to, to be understanding when they may miss an appointment because they're not sure that they're prepared to talk about the things that they don't think you're gonna understand. Yeah, no, and you're totally right. I mean, obviously, it's talking about like our Queensbridge initiative, it would be a total failure if we went in, introduced all these programs and every, you know, course teacher or support group leader didn't look like the people that they were there to support. You know, I, I think, it, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's kind of obvious. So I, I think especially, even if they don't have the same experiences, there's enough of that common denominator where you're just more comfortable talking about it with people who have somewhat of a similar experience, I, I get that. So we're almost out of time, so I, I wanna shift on a couple of things. So I, I mentioned um, that besides your incredible professional work, you're also the chair of the uh, New York State Office of Mental Health um, Multicultural Action Committee. So can you talk a little bit about what the MAC does and 
how you see that as being part of the solution to uh, all these issues that we're talking about? Sure, sure. So the statewide multicultural advisory committee, um, we pretty much are serve as an advisory board to the Office of Mental Health. Um, and we work directly with the Bureau of Cultural Competence and also sometimes in, involving the executive committee and the commissioner of Office of Mental Health. Our main focus is to assist OMH as a non partial or impartial body in making sure that all of the programs that they put out are, are equitable and we're going to reach and, and pretty much serve their purpose to all people in the state of New York. And so it's a really, it's driven towards, you know, closing the gap on health care, mental health care disparities, um, addressing the social determinants of mental health and policy that is going out. And really just making sure that, you know, hey, we're paying attention to the people that have varying abilities. We're paying attention to the people with um, different language access issues and making sure that, you know, this program sounds great, but how are you going to get it to all of these people in this catchment area? Um, and, and, you know, and it, 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 there's initiatives towards zero suicide. Also, we're challenging them on the workforce, um, workforce development. How are you training people? How are you retaining people? How are you recruiting people of color? Um, all of those things are, are key ingredients to, to the work that we're, we're trying to do. Um, we've helped them develop a strategic plan to address matters of diversity and inclusion throughout all of their facilities, licensing agencies, um, and then obviously, you know, the main branch of OMH. So uh, it's, it's, it's rewarding work, but it, it is a lot of work. Um, but we're all volunteers. No one gets paid on our board to be there, but we are committed to making sure that, you know, the people of New York State get the mental health care that they deserve. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And we're really looking forward. We're going to have several members of the committee on uh, in the coming weeks. So everyone I know has a very unique story. But before I let you go, I, I do want to talk about the work that the clinic is doing. It's so important. You know, there aren't enough uh, adolescent and child psychiatric services to begin with. So what you're doing is just so valuable. So two questions. Number one, how have you tell a little bit about what the clinic does, but how have you had to adapt during COVID? And I'll have one more follow-up for you. Sure, absolutely. Um, so our clinic does, um, we have a, a host of psychiatrists, psychologists, nurse practitioners, social workers that all work out of our clinic. We, um, with a primary, I'm premier academic medical center on, on Long Island, or primarily in the Suffolk County, we're the only one. Um, and so a lot of people come to us for a variety of services, medication management, psychotherapy, psychological assessment. Um, we also do a lot of work with uh, autism, folks on the autism spectrum disorders. Uh, we also, you know, are, are really working hard to start and try to branch out to be more inclusive and offer some LGBT services in the near future. So we're trying to do a lot here at Stony Brook um, in, depart in the, the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health. The shift for COVID-19, I gotta tell you, we found a way, we were, we would always been looking at telehealth and wanting to figure out how to do it and how to do it safely and carefully um, and, and fairly and equitable to, to, so that we could reach you know, far beyond our current catchment area. And then when COVID-19 happened, we got telehealth up and running for our entire clinic within seven days. Um, and so, you know, we had some things that we needed, but we needed equipment, we needed to train people, we needed to get them credentialed, so we had to do training, we had to, like, it was quick. Um, but I'm, I'm really happy to say that within a week, uh, we, we, our numbers skyrocketed, and we were doing business as usual within a week from, you know, having to kind of go into quarantine mode. And so, it was an aggressive shift. But I'm so glad that we were able to do it because there's so many things related to COVID-19 that are going to impact people's mental health and their emotional functioning. I, and I've been continuing to say the second wave of this pandemic is going to be the emotional mental health components of people being you know, stuck in their homes for 90 days, of grief and loss of, of people that they may have lost to COVID-19 or just lost in general that they weren't able to come together as a family to grieve. There's just so many things, and I, you know, I already mentioned my daughter being, you know, amongst all the other children in the world, um, the seniors that didn't get the graduation they deserve. There's just so many things and ways that this impacted our lives that um, folks are going to experience a lot of loss and a lot of trauma, and, and we're going to be here to help, and that really makes me feel happy. And we'll be able to continue to provide quality care, and it'll continue to be very safe, 
and we'll be able to catch people where they are, you know, wherever they're comfortable being at that moment, we're, we'll be here. Yeah, and that's so important. And it kind of bridged me right to my last question for you. So obviously we know the services that you offer and your colleagues offer are, are needed more than ever. Uh, I totally agree with you about that second mental health wave coming into the crisis. And to the governor's credit, he's certainly talked about mental health and has provided, you know, the, the call lines and other services. But on the other hand, we know if there's not um, federal intervention, we're looking at massive budget cuts to community mental health uh, providers. It's you know, one of we have, we have two nightmare scenarios. We have, you know, hospitals who are using COVID to eliminate uh, inpatient beds, which is a whole nother subject that we're gonna be talking about, but we know the threats that are coming to community mental health providers. So can you talk about that? I mean, as a community health provider, your concerns about that and what people can do and the importance of voicing the need to support our mental health system. Absolutely. Um, you know, I do understand that the, the pot of gold is not endless, right? I, I understand that it's a pot and, and not a fountain. Um, but I will be clear that not caring or, or, or reducing mental health services at a time like this, where we're going to be in recovery mode from a global pandemic, is just not, it's just not smart. Um, it, these services are, this is going to be a population health crisis if folks don't get the mental health care that they need. And it, it's just as simple as that. Um, we cannot afford, you know, for, for with, and, and that we didn't even touch base on the, the unemployment and the impact of that, right? So we cannot afford for people to go without insurance, without care, without attention. It's not the time to, to pull from mental health care you know and i know schools in particular because i work with the youth are going to be under significant budget cuts their state aid is cut and i understand that and i know that there are going to be some really 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 difficult decisions that are coming down the pike i understand that but at this time your kids are going to need the care that they're used to and then on top of that the kids that have not been previously identified as having social emotional issues they certainly will now there's, a, there's large pockets of kids that were school refusers this whole time that didn't want to come to school because they were worried about being bullied or worried about germs. And now we had a global pandemic that told them, okay, so you can stay home now. How are we going to get those kids back into school if they don't have a mental health worker to help them, right? Um, we've been having people that, okay, you have to have insurance. They just lost their jobs, right? They need support. Right? They're going to need vocational training, sure, but they're also going to need mental health training. You've got people that are going to, how am I paying my mortgage? How am I feeding my family? Employment's going to go up, oh, what is it, a, a month from today. There's no more unemployment, right? So how are those people going to manage? You know, people that are close to retirement, the economy crashed, they're not going to be prepared to handle this type of trauma and mental health providers are going to be required to, to address those needs. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Dr. For you shared so much with us. Um, you know, obviously we have a lot of challenges ahead and, and we're so lucky to have people like you in the field who are um, being a part of the solution and, and addressing these problems. And you know, you have a partner with NAMI New York State. We're, we're proud to stand beside you on all the issues that we discussed today and work together to improve people's lives for the better. So thank you for what you do every day. Thank you for sharing your perspectives for, with us today. We certainly learned a lot. So thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you for watching. I know you probably got a lot out of today's episode. I hope uh, you take some of what you learned today and put it into practice. And till we see you next time on Perspectives, remember to stay connected, stay supported, and stay inspired. Thank you. Mm -hmm.